Toxic masculinity is a word we hear all too often in this day and age, as it's recently become more and more recognised and more is being continually done to counter it and educate people. There is an assumption that before the past decade, every part of the media has been a stirring pot of all these now considered negative traits. So naturally, you'd expect a male Doctor Who companion from the 1960s, one whose backstory is a soldier led solely by a sense of nationalism to be the epitome of toxic masculinity. But Jamie McCrimmon is actually a leader in the fight against this portrayal of men in television and is in fact a near perfect male role model, one we wouldn't see again in Doctor Who for quite some time. According to Oxford, toxic masculinity is a set of attitudes and ways of behaving stereotypically associated with or expected of men regarded as having a negative impact on males and on society as a whole. Examples of toxic masculinity according to Oxford include a need to assert themselves as independent and self-reliant, a common vocalisation as women as nothing more than sexual objects, bit too tight. A championing of heterosexuality as the unalterable norm. A tendency to resort to violence at the first occasion. A need to always have the final word. An inability to display emotion. A compulsive need to take risks. Not engaging in housework or anything traditionally associated as feminine jobs. The fight against toxic masculinity is particularly important as many academics and researchers say that it's the primary cause of mental health issues in men and by extension the abnormally high male suicide rates that multiple countries in the West share. One of the many ways this can be reduced is to reduce the normalisation of these qualities in the media. Having characters that display these traits isn't an issue but having a show glorify these characters and fail to show them as in the wrong is an issue. The issue of the 11th Doctor being a ridiculously close match to the traits I've mentioned may at first seem amusing, but at no point does the show ever go out of its way to condemn the 11th Doctor for this. He is the hero of the show, and he was a role model to a generation of boys who watched Doctor Who as children. Many of those who fail to recognise the 11th Doctor as a poor male role model have grown up to be themselves victims of toxic masculinity. It's not just the 11th Doctor that has this problem, numerous male Doctor Who companions are easily identifiable as falling victim to toxic masculinity, and many of them aren't condemned by the narrative or any other characters in any meaningful way for this. There is only one definite example I can find of a male companion who is very obviously someone who suffers from toxic masculinity being continually called out for it in the show. Someone who the show purposely made a holder of these traits and then used it to show that these things are bad. That person is Harry Sullivan. A character who was almost a satire of someone whose views were in the past and as well Again and again he'd embody all these qualities but someone would always call him out for it. This never happened really with any other male companions and it certainly never happened with the 11th Doctor. Harry Sullivan is a character from 1974 and yet the writing is so much more advanced in terms of how modern attitudes towards masculinity and mental health are viewed than anything written during the Moffat era. James McCrimmon, known as Jamie, was a companion to the Doctor between 1966 and 1969, appearing in 112 episodes during that period, opposite Patrick Charlton as the second Doctor. The character originated in a serial by Elwyn Jones and script editor Jerry Davis called The Highlanders, where he was simply written as a one-off guest character. The Highlanders, which is sadly entirely missing from the BBC archives after they adjunct it, took place in 1746, just after the Battle of Culloden, which was the culmination of the failed Jacobite rebellion period where Highlanders were being hunted down by the British. 
One such Highlander was a young piper, Jamie McCrimmon, and he soon became embroiled in an adventure with the Doctor and companions Ben and Polly. Although written out at the end of the serial, it was decided by producer Innes Lloyd that the character would continue joining the regular cast from the end of the adventure. Hastily, a new final scene to the serial was written and shot before being amended to the end of episode 4 for broadcast. But it's important because Jamie was never intended to be a companion. He wasn't written with the idea of being a leading action hero type akin to Ian or Steven in mind, but instead it was simply just a character from a story. And unlike other companions, he doesn't lose all his defining character traits as soon as his introductionary story finishes. The fact that Jamie's from the Highlands in 1746 remains throughout his time an incredibly important part of his character. I know it seems obvious, but the fact he retains a Scottish accent throughout, despite it not being Fraser Hines' natural accent, continually reminds us of this. And yes, I know that sounds silly, because obviously, but that wasn't always the case for companions introduced in 1966. What's more impressive is the fact that Jamie's kilt became a key part of his identity, as following the first serial, the costume could have easily changed, but instead, it became part of Jamie's silhouette and a constant reminder of who he is as a character. Jamie McCrimmon embodies everything that modern day society says that men should embody. Even though the character was written in the 60s, and in fact was a character that came from 1746, the character is better for this than all of his contemporaries and many more to come. Firstly, let's get this out of the way, Jamie is protective of women. That could be considered one of his defining character traits. But he's also just as protective of men. In fact, Jamie is really someone who is just generally protective of everyone. This in itself already rules out the not showing emotions argument as a lot of what he does is him unadulteratedly showing his emotions and then going to help or protect someone. Often this is women because he's around a lot of women who the writers like to often put in a lot of peril. But as soon as anyone even lays a finger on the doctor, he's right there ready to save him because he deeply cares. Just take a look at the ending of Fury from the Deep, where Jamie's perhaps at his most emotional that any male companion gets for a very long time. Jamie is not afraid to hide his emotions, but in fact recognises them as his greatest asset. If you take a look at his predecessor Ben Jackson, it's almost laughable when he has a go at the Cybermen for removing their emotions when he's about as stoic as you can get. Jamie is the opposite of that, and thus the perfect companion to face the Cybermen in four separate stories. Beyond an ability to comfortably display emotions, if we take a further look at the traits of toxic masculinity, we can see that Jamie is a pretty good fit when it comes to finding an antithesis. If we take a look at a need to assert themselves as independent and self-reliant, then instantly we see a contrast to Jamie. Unlike some other companions, Jamie completely understands that traveling the universe is best done as a team. Even though he's basically the Doctor's number one fan, he just as much wants to encourage a more the merrier attitude. Every other venture it seems he's trying to get someone else to join the crew and when Victoria left, as mentioned before, Jamie really really struggles. Struggled so much he had to um, make up a reason for Victoria leaving in order to keep himself together as well because she left because she was Travelling with the Doctor was too much for her and not because, well... Why she wants to learn graphology, I have no idea. Uh, will we ever get back? Yeah, two Doctors bad. If we take a look at the point, a tendency to resort to violence at the first occasion, then maybe your prejudices of Jamie's superficial character may play a part. But in fact, Jamie is pretty much the opposite of this. Yes, Jamie's introduced following a battle and holding a sword, but following this, he does very much settle mostly for a brain over brawn approach. Now, speaking of brain, it is true that Jamie doesn't actually possess much of that, but he thinks he does. This actually becomes an advantage to him because many enemies will judge him by his appearance and negate the fact he isn't just the muscle they think he is. A lot of this is the influence of the Doctor rubbing off on him, as he evolves over his tenure and really grows into the practice of thinking his way out of problems. Jamie will often come up with plans with varying degrees of success, but the point is he will always think things through in detail. Next, let's take a look at a need to always have the final word. Now, it can't be denied that Jamie has a bit of a gob on him, usually done for comedic effect. 
but let's just say that he's happy enough to defer the final word to the doctor almost every time. He likes to get his opinion across and have it considered but fundamentally he understands that the doctor is the one with the final say and he graciously accepts that. And then let's look at the argument, a compulsive need to take risks and there is a view that Jamie might qualify for this as he is often daring and will get himself into lots of mad situations easily but I think we can just about give Jamie a pass to this as this is kind of the qualifying characteristic to be a Doctor Who companion and the show just wouldn't work without it. I think it's nearly impossible to find a non-risk taking companion so I think this point can be negated in the interest of fairness. And then there's the not engaging in household work or anything traditionally associated as feminine jobs. Well, um, well, um, well. Following with that, we have two items left on our list, both of which need to be covered in a little more depth. Now, one of the items that cannot be ignored is the a common vocalisation of women as nothing more than sexual objects. Jamie is sexist. He shows sexist attitudes multiple times throughout his run. There is no excusing it, he is sexist. So why isn't he the perfect candidate for toxic masculinity? Well I think the previous few minutes tell you that and the fact that the title of this video calls him the near perfect male role model and this right here is said in perfection. Unlike some other aspects, this doesn't gradually fade away over time either. In the War Games, his final regular story, Jamie has this interaction. The primitive idea is about women knowing their place. How does he know? Oh, sounds a nice chap. Jamie, this is no <laughs> laughing matter. We've got to persuade him to stay here until Russell gets back. Well, look, if he won't listen to you, then he's not. No, gonna... not to me. But. Really? However, a lot of this is the societal norms of the time Jamie's from, 1746, and compared to many of his contemporaries, Jamie is relatively modern in his thinking. While he maintains prejudices about women, they aren't really sexual in nature, and he doesn't really see them as sexual objects, just more so subservient. Why doesn't he see them as sexual objects? Well, speculation on that may be coming up soon, but the fact he doesn't shows a radically different point of view to other men like him from 1746. Let's also make clear, like Harry Sullivan, the show calls Jamie out for those attitudes he expresses. The female companions, the Doctor or guest character always looks disgusted by it or tells Jamie how it is. The show's writers know Jamie's being sexist and they are purposely crafting it away to be like, don't do it like this. While sexism is surely a marked down, the fact that this attitude, or worst, is shared by other male companions on top of other qualities that Jamie does not possess shows that Jamie is by and far the leader in the cause of positive masculinity. However, a final point that we haven't yet covered perhaps shines a different light on all of this. During the course of writing this video, the topic of Jamie's sexuality has taken an unexpected prominence in the fandom's discussion of the character. I don't want to lean in too heavily on recent events, but it certainly opened up a debate about possible queer coding present in Jamie's character. Most of this speculation comes from humorous moments purposely improvised by Fraser Hines and Patrick Charlton during their episodes, not for any particular reason other than the humour of it. Here's Fraser Hines speaking about it in 2012. We did that little gag that we didn't rehearse because Morris Barry would not have allowed it if we'd rehearsed it. it is when we were supposed to take Victoria's hand to go into this huge tomb, tomb and we just we worked out between us. We took each other's hand, you know, and then we went, and then we took Victoria's and get, because we just knew they couldn't do retakes unless something the camera fell into shot. So we just knew that we'd rehearsed it, we wouldn't allow it. So we each did it on and it's a sweet little thing, it's just like oh, Jeff, you know, Didn't Victoria. warn me at all. I thought, what was going on now? You well, never they, warned me about ad libs or anything like that. You just had no, to take it. I mean, getting, well, it was a nice oh. surprise on your face, going, uh oh. And and However, this sparked fans, even as early as those at time of broadcast, to collate their own ideas about it. Not only do we see multiple moments of flirtation littered throughout, but also Jamie's deep friendship with the Doctor is unparalleled. No male companions have cared quite so deeply for the Doctor as Jamie did. Additionally, some of Jamie's more feminine qualities and general good looks encourage shippers over the years to put the Doctor and Jamie together and view Jamie as homosexual. 
If we think back to Jamie's sexism, especially the fact that it was never particularly sexual, but instead more a disinterested woman, and a desire that they should know their place and lead the boys to it, indicates that maybe this could have been a byproduct of his own struggles with accepting and understanding his sexuality. It's not uncommon for people who are questioning to take it out in the form of sexism, and in fact absurd sexism is considered a sign that someone may be struggling with their sexuality. Perhaps this is what Jamie was up to here. While Jamie's sexuality has been a topic of intense questioning over five decades, we can be fairly certain this likely was not intentional. It seems to be a mix of successive writing for the character by multiple different writers that all paint his character in a consistent way, the performances by Hines and Troughton intended to be humorous, and a lot of reading between the lines. So was Jamie gay? Well that's up to you, the viewer. The episodes have long been transmitted, the stories are out there. If you think Jamie was gay, then he was. If you think he wasn't, then he wasn't. Fraser Hines thinks they were just good friends. But with the absence of new canon material expanding on this, it's entirely up to you, the viewer. So Jamie McCrimmon fits the bill pretty well when it comes to finding a near perfect male role model. He's a team player, he was happy to think his way out of problems with varying degrees of success, but he'll stand back and allow the doctor and those more intelligent than him to do what they need to do without hesitation. He'll freely show his emotions and is more than happy to muck in when needed and is happy to be as gay or not gay as you like. That to me sounds like a pretty good male role model and I don't think it's for another five decades that you get anything near enough as good from Doctor Who. Jamie McCrimmon is the near perfect embodiment of positive masculinity.